man, I'm starting to feel like I should just move to Australia. Oh, yeah? <laughs> What's the draw? I... <laughs> just it's just convenience nothing else i just <laughs> like i just got off the phone with our our partners in australia uh working on the mobile app for my company and then i rush home to quickly call you it's like it's australia day for me <laughs> you spent all your time talking to to get a mate and strife <laughs> the the main thing that i've picked up which which isn't a uh, something that's said in the U.S. at all, but it's just the word "cheers." It's used a lot, and it can mean it can mean like "thank you" or "goodbye" or anything. <laughs> yep, I'm not sure if that's Australian or or um like UK English. I have a feeling it's from yeah. the UK, but it gets used a ton. Yeah, yeah. Cheers is so, a pretty typical way of saying thanks. Yeah. So I'm. I'm picking up on that, and it's it's weird because I I've been spending so much time talking to people who use that. It I, like I'm starting to get the gist of like how to throw that into a conversation and make it sound natural, but at the same time, the act of me saying it all makes it feel forced. So I'd, I'm not I'm not sure what to do with that yet. But I'm really... I'm I'm open to you practicing that during the podcast. That's fine. Um... I'll let you know if it sounds forced. Oh, cheers. Or... <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would not have given that a second thought if you'd said it to me passing on the street for some reason. <laughs> the hard thing for me is that it just doesn't sound right without an Australian accent, so when I say it, it sounds really fake. Because I only hear people with Australian accents saying it. Ah, uh, okay. So, uh, are you trying to put on an Australian accent or not put on an Australian accent when you say it? No, I actually try really hard when I'm in conversation with people uh, not to like naturally pick up on their accents and dialects because I feel like it could be interpreted as me mocking them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So, so I, I, I try extra hard not to do that in conversations. But it does it does like my, my naturally kind of go towards that when I talk with someone for a long time. Yeah, I think so too. I have to try... Just during so, the, doing this podcast, not to, you know, not to start drifting towards how you pronounce things. It's a it's a skill that I practice a lot because my my girlfriend is is uh, very southern and her family is extremely southern, and uh, a lot of times like a southern accent is is thought of as like less educated or kind of like a hillbilly kind of thing, and so it can really seem like. I'm talking down to someone if I start talking like them when I'm like visiting her family. So those times, especially I work really hard not to do yeah, that. Fair enough. There are some, um, North American pronunciations, pronunciations that are just better though, in my books, one of them being, um, Microsoft cloud services, the name for that. <laughs> oh, Azure. Yeah, Azure. That just sounds a lot better than the Australian or UK English way of pronouncing it, which I can't even think what it it's is. It's like Azure? Yeah. No, it's um, Azure, I think. Azure? Yeah. But Azure just rolls right off the tongue in comparison. Yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure if... I mean, I guess this is kind of the pinnacle of American English, but it's like, I don't know if Azure is actually recognized as the correct pronunciation or that's just us being lazy when we <laughs> say no, it. don't tell but... me that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna hold on to aluminium so, forever, though. I'll never pry that out of my hands. Oh, you'd love the shirt I'm wearing right now. Um, have you seen the shirts that the fake Johnny Ive Twitter account sells? <laughs> no, I mean I love the account, but so I have not he, seen it selling <clears throat> shirts. He's got this great shirt, and it's a portmanteau of minimalism and aluminium. And I'm gonna try to pronounce it now, and I'm gonna mess it up. Um. Minimalu minimalism. <laughs> it just says that across the shirt. It's great. Oh, that's awesome. I had a, an interesting conversation today, and it led to a question to ask you. So I was talking to my coworker about the fact that I had to call our mobile partner in Australia about our app later. I said, I got to call into a meeting in Australia. And he said, oh, are you doing the, the podcast tonight? And I said, well, you know, you know about my podcast? He's like, yeah, it's you and, and uh, that guy with four names. 
<laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, because my surname is because... like triple... It's like... Yeah, yeah, it's got two spaces. Yeah, two in spaces it. in it. <laughs> that gives me four <laughs> names. <laughs> so I've I've never been completely clear on how that actually works. Is so Vander Mosel is your is just your surname. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yep. And but what parts of that are and aren't capitalized? Uh you'd only capitalize the, the M because that's the, the right. place name and the Vander just typically means like from the or of the it's kind of similar to how say in an Irish O'Brien like the O is just like of Brian like John of Brian right uh, so the Vander but usually the O is capitalized yeah that's right um I'm not sure in that case but um yeah I guess if you're writing in English like James of the Moselle then like the of and the the wouldn't be right. capitalized but I certainly <laughs> know people with similar names that put capitals all over the place like a capital v and then there's no space and then der and that's all in lowercase and oh interesting yeah there's all sorts of interpretations i guess like once there's no real link to where the name is from then once that you know you're enough generations away from that and no one really knows because you know no one even speaks dutch anymore in my family oh it's mosul uh uh, place in um, I don't even know where Dutch is spoken. <laughs> Holland, Holland, <laughs> <laughs> the Netherlands, I should say. Um, the Moselle <laughs> is a river, and uh, oh, interesting! It, it goes through, I believe, uh, the Netherlands, certainly Germany and uh, Belgium, uh, with mm-hmm. slightly different spellings. Uh, the, the most famous, um variant of Moselle is the Moselle wine, but that's spelled something like M O S E L L E, something along that, along those lines. Huh. I don't know if I've heard of that or not. I'd probably recognize it if I saw it. Maybe. But uh, interesting. When you started this, uh, when you said uh, oh, the guy with four names, that uh, gave me a little like uh, heart attack because I actually have two middle names and then for me I, of course i just count my surname as a like a single name so when you said the guy with four <laughs> names i thought my, my surname and my two middle names have somehow made it to some random person on the internet like the podcast <laughs> what is he was happening? so infatuated with our show that he did some deep research on you <laughs> Not <every other> day. <laughs> that's how we know we've made it Right, yeah. It's as soon as is a, as soon as we're invited on a podcast to talk, it's not our own, <laughs> and someone does the deep dive research that that we try to do. All right, we could use it as our, um, <laughs> what do you call it? Our, uh, our. Uh, there's some really classic saying. Uh, our bar, our standard bar, our. <laughs> I don't know where okay. you're going with this. Like the market to say whether we've made it or not. Oh, we yeah. need a chat room. Um, <laughs> we need a chat room? Our yardstick, is that it? I have never heard that phrase. Okay. I'll leave it. <laughs> it could be an Australian thing, I don't know. No, because we don't even use yards in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Meter stick. <laughs> never heard that in my life. <laughs> I have a brand new iPad. Do you want to talk about it now, or should we talk about it after the show? Uh, I guess it's up to you. Do you want to try to have the conversation flow naturally, or are you going to try to to uh, cut and paste it around in post? <laughs> <laughs> wow, are you slagging off my editing efforts in the last show? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> I wasn't saying you do bad. I'm just saying that that our conversations get moved around. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. <laughs> When the pre-show goes like for an for an extremely long amount of time, I just feel obligated to move some of it to the back of the show because I don't want to put three people through like twenty five minutes of us talking about stuff they might not be here for. I mean, they could be here just to listen to the mm. top five um, posts from the subreddit. They they come for the post and they stay for the the whinging. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that was probably one of the first Australianisms you picked up, hey. 
Yeah, I think we, like, there's a show title, like, one of our first episodes. Yeah, having a whinge. Yeah, classic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I say we kick into the show and we can talk about my new iPad later. All right, let's do it. Good morning. Good morning. I like that you uh, took my list of topics and, and uh, curated it a little better. Sorry? Uh, the list of show topics. Did you already make one? Did you? Oh, I did. I see. I I put July 14th instead of August 14th in the notes, so you didn't even <laughs> Dude, notice. I was looking at and, that And thinking, you picked some more interesting it's topics It's been a long me. time since our last show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's two copies of notes, but let's do yours because yours, you picked some more interesting topics than I did. I just want to see what you've picked now. Let's see if there's any overlap. All right. So the first one is exactly the same. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. I left out the Samsung ads thing being removed. Uh, I mm-hmm. left out Spotify as well. Credit card and mm-hmm. um, iPhone 11 Pro. Okay. So. Yeah. We, yeah. Okay. We had a, a fair bit of overlap there. Well, the top post on both of our lists is that um, it's a, a self post by user Phony Boy. Uh, a little whinge, you might say, that Apple is shipping $1,000 phones with 64 <laughs> gig base storage, while Samsung base storage starts at 256 gigabytes. So uh, the the Samsung Note 10 was launched since our last show, and the base storage mm-hmm. is 256 gigabytes, which is it's kind of massive. Um, yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. Did you watch the keynote or watch the Verge's like blah blah in X minutes? <laughs> uh I don't think I saw the the condensed verge video but I did watch a few like hands-ons and and spec like overviews videos afterwards. Uh but I never sit through the Samsung keynotes. The few times I've tried they've been not very enjoyable. So I just thought it was amazing that the hole that they held it in. If you watch the video it's like a encased by a screen kind of. Really? I did not see that. Remembering it wrong. That's pretty cool. uh, (laughs) I mean, they did something similar with like the fold announcement, where they screens like went around the walls and like even on the floor and ceiling. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly how it was. It was almost like a church of galaxy. The kind of it was yeah, (laughs) towering up on all sides and up the front, and the little people were like little ants in front of ten thousand people. (laughs) They got it. They got to do that to sell it because their presenters aren't that great. Yeah, although they've certainly improved over the years. Uh, yeah. The only other thing I took away really from it, um, besides the storage thing, is that the phones have liquid cooling inside them now. Although I think the um, the, the S10 had it as well, and they call it uh, vapor cooling. It's like a little vapor chamber that somehow draws heat away from the, the chip. Um, right. To, to keep your frame rates up when you're playing games. Yeah, it's definitely a stretch to call it liquid cooling when they've got just the smallest amount of water vapor probably in a piece of copper. <laughs> less than a drip out of the end of a syringe. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know if those actually make any difference or not, but it's a good like marketing buzzword. So, I thought it was the opposite, really. I mean, sorry, yeah, a good marketing buzzword, but it's hardly good marketing to say oh, the chips in our phone, they actually need liquid cooling to, keep, to maintain frame rates when you're doing anything <laughs> demanding. Uh, and that's just to keep up with last year's iPhone. Yes, score one Apple in that case. <laughs> <laughs> um, but maybe they are trying to appeal to like the the PC gamer market, who that you know the hardcore ones typically are using some sort of liquid cooling. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's maybe less. Well, hope, hopefully, they're not trying to brag about their chips being hot. But I think it's definitely like people see liquid cooling and think, oh, that. Only high performance computers have liquid cooling, so this phone must be high performance as well. Right, and, right, yeah, that's certainly one way of looking at it as well. But, uh, so it seems like uh, sixty four gigabytes is becoming the new sixteen gigabytes. You took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> uh, I think, yeah, for the most part, I completely agree with this. Um, we're in the same position we were in a few years ago with the 16 gigabit models being completely unreasonable. And now that Apple is selling phones with 4k cameras in them and, and well, I was going to say apps are getting bigger, 
but they're getting smaller. while the apps themselves, <laughs> yeah, they're they're doing better to strip out uh, like unnecessary code. Uh, I don't know. I still think that sixty four is is unreasonable, but it's not as unreasonable as sixteen was when they finally switched. I think most people could still get by on sixty four. I think there are there are two issues. What is the minimum amount of storage you can actually put in a phone? Uh, and sixteen gigabytes is certainly below any standard that, that I would think would be reasonable. Uh, and then the second issue is when you're selling a premium phone, what is a reasonable amount of storage to sell in a premium phone? Right, and that's I think that's more of the question we're looking at here. Um, if this phone was at half its price, people probably probably wouldn't be as offended at 64 gigabytes. Um, because even though you might be able to get by, you'd expect to get closer to the 256 number that Samsung is now offering. Right, and but Apple's never been one to to charge not much to, to have low costs for <laughs> for stuff like this. Um, as as Waterloo Chill. Waterloo Chill in the comments says it's actually a way bigger issue with Macs, but I think they're actually talking about mm-hmm. the base storage, and that, that's not something I'd agree with. They're saying that 128 gigs base storage in a um, in a pr- in a pro computer um, is right. ridiculous, and we kind of talked about that maybe two shows ago, yeah. and I was trying to say that I do think 128 gigs is kind of bare bare minimum probably not usable for my usage like and for someone who does rely heavily on cloud services 256 is just a way more comfortable number and even when you have things like um, and this is the same for the phone when you're talking about like 64 gig um, when you're using all the optimized like store your iCloud documents like optimal versions only uh, photos make sure only optimized versions What's the other one? Music as well. That has some sort of automatically manage how much music is stored on the device. Even with all of those turned on, I I, I think I'd struggle with 128 gig. Like the the systems need space to be able to to move stuff around and to keep a, a certain amount of cache. And neither macOS or iOS is really that good at like aggressively keeping these. I, I'll just call them databases to like a really like small amount. Or, or noticing when the system's like at its limits and cutting it down. I've certainly had like mm-hmm. uh, photos library on the Mac being like 30 gig and the computer being completely out of space and photos is like, eh, well, I guess that's the best I could do, 30 gig, huh? <laughs> yeah, so 256 is kind of like the minimum comfortable amount that, that I would live with. Um, cons- Are we talking about phones or computers uh, right for, now? For the computer. And okay. well, on the phone, 64 gig is... I would say it's just enough to for for the same concept to have all these optimal things actually work optimally. I think thirty two gig, you'd probably be hitting that thirty two gig, and these these services probably wouldn't be able to really keep up with uh, with keeping optimized versions or or keeping their sizes of their databases down. Right. I'm just looking at the um the storage I'm using on my phone. And my phone currently has 290 gigabytes used. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh-huh. But but 203 gigabytes of that is my photos library. Um, so if I if I wasn't storing my photos library on my phone, I'd be down to 90 gigabytes, and. I could save a few by offloading. It says I can save over six gigabytes by offloading unused apps, which I'm not surprised by because I mostly apps I download and forget about and never use. Where is the rest uh, of it? Though? I have twelve gig. I have twelve gigabytes of voice memos, and that's from recording the show. Um, I have eleven gigabytes of music. Um, and this category says on my iPhone. Oh, seven gigabytes of uh. Or sorry, nine gigabytes of like iCloud file data stored on my phone. Um, so I could I could probably get down to below the sixty four gigabyte threshold without it affecting my day to day outside of like photos taking a little longer to load in and streaming all of my music. Um, oh, and I have twenty gigabytes of podcasts. Jeez, wow. <laughs> so yeah, there's definitely ways I could cut down. 
the only reason I have that much storage used is because I have so much that I don't worry about it. Uh, but that's why I pay that much, because I like to not worry about it, and I would have to actively manage my storage if I had 64 gigabytes. Do you think even if you had Optimize turned on for all those things you just mentioned, you'd still have to actively manage storage? Uh, well, I, I guess turning it on is what I mean, and by actively manage, I don't mean necessarily having to choose which things I want to keep and delete, but more like have to deal with the slow loading of my photos, mm-hmm. getting the high res versions yep. or or streaming my music and things like that. So it's not a major inconvenience. I've definitely lived that way in the past. Um, so I could see where you'd get by on 64 and be reasonably comfortable, especially with some of Apple's optimizations. But it's again, the question of should you have to live with those optimizations when you're paying a thousand dollars for a phone? Yeah. So that's the next topic. And I think we we've talked quite a little, uh, quite a lot about uh, Apple charging a premium for any sort of storage or memory upgrades. Yeah, there's nothing new. <laughs> there's nothing new. <laughs> Although, I think by the time they discontinued the 16 gigabyte iPhone, the the next upgrade tier already was skipping 32 and going right to 64, uh, which already made it obvious that 16 wasn't usable and that even 32 was you know getting out of there and 64 was really kind of what you'd you'd want to be comfortable and they're doing this already with 64 as well uh there's no 128 gigabyte option right now it's 64 right to 256 um but this seems like it hurts a little more just because there's such a bigger gap between 64 and 256 and there's between 16 and 64 yeah yeah (laughs) well one thing i hope they don't do is release an even cheaper phone with less than 64 gig storage because that's sort of uh going backwards is is just going to be a massive pain. That's not out of character for them. Um, maybe not in their main markets, but I know like in India, they specifically release lower storage tier phones. Oh, did they? Okay. Mm-hmm. But I think their market is a little... Uh, I don't know what the word is. They can't afford the higher prices on luxury goods like that, so that was kind of to meet in the middle. I think the word you're looking for is emerging... They're an emerging market. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing that we should yeah. note and pointed out by Kaneki2019 in the comments is that Samsung's only just started selling higher base storage this year. The base storage for the S9 was 64 gigabytes. Do you think Apple will be increasing nope. their base storage <laughs> this year? <laughs> no. I, I think... I think you're completely right. There's not enough demand for it right now. They can definitely squeeze at least another year out of it, if not a couple. Oh, yeah, easily. How long did 16 gigabytes hang around as like a ridiculous level? It was like a good three, four years, wasn't it? Well, when when did they drop 8? Was That was either like with the 3G or 3GS, they dropped the 8 gigabyte model. Mm, and yep. they had, then they had 16 as the entry up until, what, the 7? <laughs> <laughs> so the four <laughs> through to the seven, maybe even the three GS. At least, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, th- so they've got a long way to go with this sixty four if they if they really want to run with it. You know what else the S ten the sorry the Note ten dropped is SD card slots. So now you've got um, a high storage and no SD card slots. So it's kind of you win some and you lose some uh, if SD card slots were your thing. Well, that's, uh, what was that? The Note 10 doesn't have micro SD, but the Note 10 Plus does. Oh, really? Okay. No, I didn't say that. Yeah. Which is which is interesting to me to have a Note 10 and a Note 10 Plus, because up until this year, the, the Note has always been kind of an everything in the kitchen sink phone. And so it was like, we we're going to throw everything at this. It's going to have maxed out specs and every feature and gimmick we can think of. Uh, but now they have they have that in the Note 10 Plus, but then the Note 10 is more of like a toned back version, uh, more of a consumer focused version of the Note, which is not what the Note's ever been. Uh, but it doesn't matter which model of Note you get; they both don't have a headphone jack. <laughs> right. So now is a good time to bring <laughs> up um, one of your topics: is that Apple? Uh, sorry, not, uh, how about you introduce it? Uh, okay, let me link it to it because I did not expect us to talk about it. (laughs) Uh, So this is a post by Plaincore. Samsung ads mocking iPhones. 
quietly deleted as it follows Apple's example. Uh, so this is uh, Samsung immediately following the Note 10 announcement went and deleted all of their ads mocking Apple for dropping the headphone jack. But all of their ads um, for mocking Apple for everything else is still up, right? Right, yeah. It's not every ad mocking Apple's gone. <laughs> Just the <laughs> ones that fit the no headphone jack. But they've uh, they've been adamant about avoiding the notch so they can keep those commercials up. Hmm. I think uh, notch talk should be saved for iPhone, iPhone 11 Pro rumors. <laughs> all right. So, this is just like Google and the Pixel making fun of Apple for dropping the headphone jack the same way and then immediately dropping the headphone jack the following year. <laughs> I guess they just rely on consumers having a short memory. That's what it feels like sometimes. And I think this would have even would have gone under the radar even for consumers if they had deleted these ads like any time except immediately following the keynote <laughs> it's like we're gonna we're gonna milk these ads up until the moment that we do it and then we're immediately deleting them but not even the day before yeah so and i love how quietly they did it too i mean they didn't even release they didn't even do a press release to announce that they were deleting <laughs> these ads i guess they didn't there's been a lot of t- talk about that word on the subreddit in the last couple of weeks have you That's seen that it's thrown around like like it's candy like it does everything anyone does is quietly now if it's not like a big press release right if there's no keynote if there's no press release um it's just (laughs) done on the quiet so there was a a post i think last week that apple added the apple one to their list of of vintage computers and there's a a post on the subreddit about apple quietly updates their vintage computer list They should have made a big announcement that, uh, yeah, this 40-year-old computer is vintage now. Maybe someone went into like an Apple store with the Apple One looking for support, <laughs> pointing out rightly that it wasn't on the, yeah. <laughs> the vintage list <laughs> and still deserved support. Yeah, what triggered that? That Those someone things... would update that list with an Apple One. It's probably just an employee. Because so, it does have things like the Apple Two and Three on it already. Mm-hmm. So someone probably just saw it and like, oh, I want to make this list complete, and they they threw it in yeah, there. Yeah, some completionist. <laughs> <laughs> but man, those Apple ones are valuable now. They can go between ten and twenty thousand dollars. Wow. Mm-hmm. Do you have an Apple one? No, <laughs> I wish that would be the centerpiece of my collection. Even if I had the money to spend, they're so like they so rarely pop up, and when they do, they're almost never for sale. So it'd be almost impossible to get one. Were those the ones with um, the motherboards engraved with uh, with names? No, there's nothing engraved on the motherboards of the Apple One. You might be thinking like the original few Macintoshes had everyone's names engraved inside the case. Oh, okay, yeah, that must be it. The Apple One was sold as just a motherboard, uh, and it was six hundred and sixty six dollars and sixty six cents, and you bought that, and then you still had to buy power supply a keyboard uh and a monitor and some kind of interface like a tape deck or something bare minimum if you wanted it to work uh because it was just some chips in a box (laughs) that's right yeah that's taking me back yeah you remember when the apple one came (laughs) out (laughs) Uh, apple is considered releasing its own credit card in the 90s but Steve Jobs didn't want to reject customers. So I thought we could use this entire topic to talk about the release of the Apple Card. And I think you're going to have to do the heavy lifting here because it's not coming out in Australia. Um, but the, the, the gist of this story is that uh, Apple had discussions with a firm about creating a card in the late 90s. Um, but reportedly, mm-hmm. Steve Jobs had an aversion to doing this because they would have to I mean, reject some people, obviously, because I mean, you don't want everyone to have a credit card, do you? Um, right. And uh, so that kind of sunk the idea at the time. This really rang true to me, and I was surprised to see uh, a story to this effect when I did, because uh, I was doing some thinking about the Apple credit card uh, 
over the last couple of weeks and and thought it was weird to have an Apple product that there would just be some people that that couldn't couldn't get it no matter how much they wanted. Just uh, like the due to, to credit reasons or whatever. Apple Watch Series One Edition. Or series Zero. <laughs> I kid. Well, I mean, you you could have fifteen thousand dollars and still get denied for the Apple Card. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of an interesting category of product where where money isn't the the gateway necessarily to owning yeah, it. And there was the cheaper Apple um, Watch, of course. So it's not a fair comparison. Sure. Uh, so I can I can see where there's there could potentially be or where there, where the version would come from for this, uh, where Apple. Uh, always kind of marketed themselves as as the company for those other guys, like the hippies or the creatives or whatever. I mean, some of the people who aren't business types are going to have the best credit, and the credit card probably wouldn't align with that image at all, especially, uh, you know, a couple decades ago. Uh, I was one of the unlucky groups that got... Did you see that Apple had some kind of processing error and sent out a weird email to everyone? Uh a couple days ago no, no. about this card. Doesn't enlighten me. So I got an email because I'm on the wait list for the Apple card um, that said, uh, you know, your time has come to get the card, uh, but please enter your uh, actual Apple ID and not just an email address so that we can get you started. Um, even though I was signed up with an Apple ID. And apparently there was a very large group of people that got this email and it was some kind of error on apple's end they just sent this whatever this message was um so i signed back up with that and i've been checking a couple times a day since then to see if i've become eligible yet and (laughs) i just pulled the app up and i suddenly have the option to to apply for the apple card right so So you can do it live on the r slash apple show live on the show you can you can see me get denied a credit card (laughs) (laughs) Um, I mean, I could walk through the process. That might be interesting if there's anything cool to see. Um, I haven't gotten an email confirming it yet, so maybe by the time the show comes out, those won't be sent yet. But if you go into the wallet app and you go to add a card uh, and hit continue, instead of the the usual just like scan a card to enter its detail, I have an Apple card option now. This is happening and live, ladies there. and gentlemen. <laughs> live applying for a credit card. Uh, it pulled in all of my personal information for the application. My name, date of birth, and phone number. I didn't have to fill that out, so I just keep going. Uh, it pulled in an, an old address for me, but it might be the one associated with my account still. I'll update it. <laughs> Make sure you take screenshots of all your personal information as well so I can put it in the uh, show notes. And then include the credit card number at the end. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, what's my social security number? I'm I'm almost 100% sure I'm going to get denied this card just so we're... We're ready for this when it comes. I have the world's worst credit, uh, okay. and I just got a car, so I'm sure it didn't help. Uh-huh. Okay. Who wants my annual income? That's the only redeeming quality I have. I'm just so filthy rich in terms of income. <laughs> Cash no. rich and credit poor. <laughs> Student loans ruined me. And not being smart about spending money during college and keeping those Is down. Is anyone, though? Yeah, exactly. That should be totally lenient on, on student loans. Submitting okay, so it says submitting your application to Goldman Sachs. Wow, that was pretty fast. Yeah, there wasn't really anything filled out. If I had the correct um, uh, address associated with my Apple account already, it would have been no data entry at all, and just next, next, next. So even had your social security number. Mm. <laughs> okay, I did have to yeah, do okay. that. That would have been the one thing. Um, oh, I got approved. Congratulations. Thanks. Um, now I have to decide if I want this credit card. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, but everyone is waiting. Here's a question. Uh, I'm going to get it. Uh, I'll accept the card. <laughs> of course you were. <laughs> for that. This is why my credit is so for bad. That, yeah, for that Mac <laughs> Pro that you're buying on the credit card. Oh, I could do that. I have a high enough Depends limit. on your credit limit. <laughs> It's a high enough limit for a Mac Pro if I want to... No, no, sorry, not a Mac Pro. A MacBook Pro, maybe. Oh, okay. Um, use as default card or set later. <laughs> There's no don't use as default <laughs> options. Only use as default or set as default later. <laughs> Classic Apple. 
I mean, it it would be silly not to because there's cash back on this versus what my primary card right now is is a uh, just a debit card that I use for primary stuff. Right. Yeah. I think that'll be the question for most people. Like, how does it compare to your current cards? Mm. Okay. Here's ordering my titanium card. Uh, just hit continue, or or I can say I don't want it. But why would you ever say that? It says confirm my address, and it's the address I typed in. It's not the old one, so I can confirm that. It says I'll receive it in six to eight days. You know, one thing I and, don't remember oh. from the announcement mm-hmm. is seeing the MasterCard logo and the ma- magnetic swipe on the back of the card. Maybe that's just my memory okay, so, erasing those uh, details. So the picture of the Apple card in the wallet app has the Apple logo in the top left and the MasterCard logo in the bottom right. Right, that's not how it is, though, But th- on the actual card. Right, the actual card just has the Apple logo and your name on the front. And the back has Goldman Sachs in one corner and MasterCard in the other corner and the swipe, which is like color coded to match the the metal. So it's it uh it's very hard to discern. Man, I bet they wish they didn't have to put a magnetic swipe on there. As I think I've said on the show before, like if you use an Australian credit card, if you use the magnetic swipe, you just get flagged as fraud. <laughs> As a fraudulent transaction, <laughs> no one has used a magnetic swipe for like a decade <laughs> in this country. So this does uh, bring up an interesting question that uh, I'll have to answer and and hadn't really come up with an answer for yet. Um, by the question of binding arbitration. Um, so by signing up for an Apple Card, uh, you. Um, immediately agree to binding arbitration. Uh, But they do give you the option to opt out of that just by sending a text message to the Apple support number. Um, I know in most other countries, binding arbitration is not a big deal and is usually actually a good thing uh, because usually it means like an unbiased third party is going to make the decision for you and have to take the whatever is going on to court. Um, In the U.S., uh, the arbiters are usually picked by the company (laughs) And usually binding arbitration means you're going to get screwed over and the company is just going to immediately get their way and you're not going to be able to fight it. Uh, so now have to decide if that's worth the time, worth the text message to opt out or... <laughs> it's probably worth your time. You think so? I have no idea. I had not even heard about this until it popped up on the subreddit during the week. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I don't expect myself to ever be in a situation where I'd want to sue Goldman Sachs over something. Um, yeah, you don't expect it, but you want to play the percentages. Yeah, I, it, I, I guess. I guess my real question would be: Is there a downside to this? You know, is there something that I'm losing by opting out of our binding arbitration that I should consider? Because right now it seems like it's just a win-win. It's one text message, and I am opting out of this seemingly malicious practice. There were questions on the sub, um, like, w- am I putting future credit increases at risk by by uh, applying for this or sending this message um, but then mm. most of the replies that were coming in were saying I've done this for previous credit cards and never had a problem getting credit increases um, so just going off what comments have said commenters have said I, I don't think there's a downside okay that'll be a process I'll look into later because I'm not exactly sure what to say or what number to even send it to so I'll miss that later and uh, I just want to put in a, uh, a financial disclaimer here. The r slash Apple show does not provide financial advice and and whatever the rest of that, <laughs> that saying is, I can't remember. It's <laughs> <laughs> probably a safe thing to, to say. Um, now, now I have two Apple credit cards. The Apple card and the Barclay card that Apple used to have. Got to catch them all, huh? <laughs> I mean, the Barclay card had some great great perks that this new one doesn't like uh uh zero percent interest for like a year on apple purchases um so that was always nice to have uh whereas this just has the straight cash back option i'm hoping that apple will be adding more perks as time goes on to this card here i'm hoping that we just get little old apple pay cash in australia at some point (laughs) in the near, near future that's crazy to me you don't have that because it seems like such a it's such a convenience for me to have and uh I would miss it a lot. 
yeah, it seems like oh, it seems like fairly low hanging fruit, but I bet it is. There's probably some weird. I bet it's loss. extremely yeah. complicated to implement something <laughs> yeah. like that. Yeah. So this this uh, card introduces some other interesting questions, uh, like if I decide I don't want to use an iPhone in the future, then I'm deciding I don't want that credit card anymore. Right, um, ecosystem lock in right right here. Yeah, that's it. I'm 100% iPhone owner forever. <laughs> or I lose that little bit of credit. <laughs> right. Um, or maybe a more common scenario. If you lose your iPhone, your only options for paying on the credit card are with a different iOS device or through phone because there's no, there's no uh, way to pay balance on your card via the web. Uh, what about on a Mac? Is there an option there? I'm just thinking, like by comparison, if you needed to pay like your iCloud storage bill or an iTunes bill, and you lost your iOS devices, mm-hmm. you could always just jump into onto your Mac and and update your payment info. I I believe you have to use the Wallet app, either the Wallet app on an iPhone or the the Wallet settings, like in the settings app in iPad. You can pay them there as well. Um, I don't think there's any way to do it from an actual computer. So that speaking of low hanging fruit, that sounds more like it. Catalyst wallet app Mac OS, is that what you're thinking? <laughs> they just need to get every every iOS app moved over to the Mac with Catalyst and <laughs> <laughs> So But yeah, that was I don't know if that was an interesting thing to listen to or not, but an interesting thing to have pop up right at this time. I found it interesting, so hopefully the audience does or did as well. So the iPhone 11 Pro is rumored to be the name of the high-end 2019 iPhone with a triple lens camera. Uh, so this is submitted by Skinny we... for Life <laughs> via Mac Rumors. Did we talk about this last show? Did we? Have I lost my mind? We talked about potential iPhone names. I think but... I think one of our potentials were Pro, but I said it. I don't think they would actually do it. Right, right. There was no rumor, though, at that point. That it was going to be called right. Pro, was there? Right. No, I don't mean did we talk about this article. I meant did it just come up in discussion? Ah, okay. Yeah, okay. So we can keep it short yeah. and sweet then. <laughs> um, the more I've heard it over the last uh, like week, the more iPhone Pro sounds possible to me. Especially, I don't remember who said this, um, but I saw a comment uh, when this when this was uh news was break, breaking i don't know i don't want, I don't want to call it breaking news when it's just a rumor but uh hey this is the apple um, subreddit we're talking about <laughs> everything's breaking news <laughs> um but it said we'll have just um iphone for basically what the the 10r replacement is and then iphone pro for the 10s replacement and you'll have iphone pro uh and then in two sizes like we have the ipad pro now and and that actually made a lot of sense to me just for kind of like unifying their naming schemes again. So I thought maybe that, that could actually work. So it would be just like the, or kind of more or less like the iPad is now. You just have, oh wait, no, you don't anymore, do you? Because <laughs> it was renamed to the Air. I was thinking you had like the iPad, which is like the... Well, we still have iPad. We have iPad, iPad Air, and We iPad do, we have Pro. iPad, which is just and, kind of got the year after it, which is like the non-laminated mm-hmm. screen. Um, not mm-hmm. stereo speakers, that sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, the iPad Air kind right. of ruins that. And then you've got the iPad Pro, which has got all the good stuff and available in two sizes. Mm-hmm. So we're thinking that'll come to the phones? That makes sense. That naming scheme makes more sense than anything I've been able to come up with so far. So, And that also gets around... I think the problem that we talked about last show is that when you've got the 10R, like, how are you going to keep updating that naming scheme without it becoming unwieldy? Like, mm-hmm. you call it the 11R, and then you have the 11RS, and then it starts sounding a bit ridiculous. And you, yeah, yeah, I think it makes sense. That that opens the question to what is next year's uh, phones going to be named? Are they just going to be new iPhone and new iPhone Pro? Are they going to well, be iPhone Pro S? Well, the rumor is that it's going to be called the iPhone 11 Pro, right? So it would just be called the 
11 ah, S fair. Pro. That's, that's, uh, that's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, I don't know. 11 we'll Pros? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it brings me back to Apple. Apple has like an official like way you're supposed to pluralize their products and it's like you have I, iPads Pro and it's not it's not iPad Pros it's iPads Pro mm-hmm. and we'll have the same thing with this I, uh, iPhone S Pro iPhones Pro <laughs> <laughs> I don't know but uh, yeah actually this, this starts to make more sense to me the more I've thought about it and I think that this might actually be the way they go this year so, so uh, let's just pretend that Pro is the name how do you think mm-hmm. Pro really describes a like a consumer level item that's probably I mean it's it's gonna be used by pros because it's just a mm-hmm. phone and like pros have phones. <laughs> pros is such a like all encompassing <laughs> generic name for for someone who does something. <laughs> so this is what I expect to differentiate Pro from the standard iPhone this year. We already know that the iPhone Pro will have a triple camera system, whereas the other one will have just two cameras. Um, but I think this might also be the year we see ProMotion on the Pro iPhones. Boom, there it is. Okay. And that'll be the the two differentiating features. Yeah, you've just convinced me 100% that, that that's going to be a thing. <laughs> what do you think about uh, Apple Pencil support? Um, I think there's probably a niche of people who would use it and like it i don't think it's going to be a big group would it be enough people to actually no. make it worth it like i'm not sure what the, the 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 technical requirements are for having apple support on an iphone like is it a whole nother capacitive layer is it like the same capacitive well, layer they're saving with like a, a tighter grid of detection zones they're saving screen thickness because they're getting rid of 3d touch so maybe they can <laughs> compensate with the Apple Pencil Air. I was going to say, I just had a um, a thought during the week that maybe 3D Touch is... Oh, I should probably save this for when we actually talk about it in, in two topics time, but the, uh, the <laughs> underscreen uh, fingerprint sensor, which is reportedly coming, reported by Ming-Chi Kuo in mm-hmm. the 2020 iPhones, maybe uh, they needed uh, that thinness to be able to do the underscreen fingerprint detection. But anyway, let's just save that for two Ooh. topics time. Um. <laughs> so, well, the, the last... Uh, uh, last is not a good way to start the sentence. I owned a Galaxy Note 3, which had a 5.7... Quietly, might I add. <laughs> I owned a... It had a 5.7-inch screen. So, a little smaller than the max iphone i don't know what the screen sizes are 6.5 is the max and the the actual 10s is five i don't know <laughs> 5.5 i have no idea uh so it's close but i was i was in university when that was out and i tried using that to take notes in class and didn't even make it through one class before i decided that taking notes on such a small screen was miserable um and i've i never tried that again until the iPad Pro, and that completely reinvented that experience for me. So, uh, Apple Pencil support on the phone is something I'm not interested at in all. I can't even imagine what you'd use it for. So, I don't, I don't feel like that's a big concern for Apple. But these rumors keep popping up, making me starting to think that maybe it will happen. <laughs> it would just look ridiculous having like the full size Apple Pencil and writing on that full small phone screen. Um, th- yeah, you'd have to have a smaller Apple Pencil, right? Exactly. And yeah, I just doubt that's going to happen. There'd probably be tradies yeah. who find it useful, you know. <laughs> Maybe I would be highly surprised if it happened. But ProMotion, on the other hand, I mean, when I go from my iPad, which is the 11 Pro, to my wife's, which is iPad with a year after it, you can see the difference. It's night and day. It's like going from like an iPhone 4 to a 3GS. You know, you don't notice how good it is when you're using it, but when you go back to an older device. It just feels like you've gone into 1990 or something. Yeah. With how... Yeah. Yeah, promotion feels overdue on the iPhone at this point, so I think this would be a good time to add it. Uh, battery life is much bigger concern, though. Um, True. 
maybe that is um, one of the differentiating features between uh like just the equivalent the, the 10r and the the pro version the the, the mm-hmm. cheaper version and the more expensive version i should say for clarity um but that might lead to an even bigger gulf in battery life between the devi- two devices as well which is going to be a weird thing if you've got this cheaper device which suddenly gets like three days battery life and then you've got the flagship which is like 12 hours hopefully apple has spent uh this next generation of of chip designs focusing on maybe efficiency instead of another big leap in in performance this year so that maybe battery battery lives can start to balance out more yeah I i wonder how much the chip affects it and how much the screen is like the main draw of battery life. Um, sure. Because between the 10s and the 10R, uh, I think that, well, they're very similar apart from really the the screen density. Uh, I think that's what's mm-hmm. reported to be the biggest battery saver on the 10R. And the reason you get two days battery is because you just have a lower PPI uh, display density. And an actual bigger battery on the 10R. <laughs> oh, is it really? <laughs> yeah, that's why it's thicker. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh yeah no, that that and even though people were were just repeating ad nauseum that an oled screen would give you better battery life the iphone with the lcd has the best battery life in the history of the iphone now so man people were really looking forward to that battery savings due to oled weren't they for years and then it <laughs> came and then it kind of disappeared because nothing happened nothing changed right yeah, it was silly to expect that ever anyway. So Apple is releasing the, or has released at this point, the fifth iOS 13 public beta today. There's another word which mm-hmm. I don't know how to pronounce anymore. Is it beta or beta? I think uh, Australian English should probably it's be definitely beta. A, it's definitely beta in the okay. US. There you go. I'm not sure anymore. <laughs> Thanks, North America. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry to lump Canadians in there. I'm not sure how you guys pronounce it. Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> Need to get uh, Christian back on the show. Get him to answer that one question for yeah. us. <laughs> <laughs> he probably threw in the word beta at some point in the last couple shows he was on. He probably did, yeah. I wonder when the internet or the, the globalization of the planet as a whole is just going to result in a single language and a single accent if that's ever going to happen that's a question for another show uh so are you running the, <laughs> the ios 13 beta still yeah yeah um it's definitely gotten more stable for me um although i was never having some of the bigger issues a lot of people were having early on some people were calling it unusable and i never felt that way even from the first one um I haven't tested whether or not I can connect to things yet. As of a version or two ago, I still couldn't connect to my dash cam or to this smart plug that I bought. I couldn't set them up. Things I have set up, I can use, but it's like a permission issue with connecting to new things. Um, But I haven't tested that recently to know if that's been fixed or not. Hopefully it has. (laughs) Because I'd like to set up my dash cam. (laughs) Um, But uh, other than that, iOS 13 has been has been great for me. Um, just speaking of connecting to things, one of the error messages that I'm seeing, or alerts, system prompts, which kind of confuses me, is when I launch many apps for the first time, it would say, uh, do you want to allow this app to access your Bluetooth devices? And I'm think, sitting there thinking, well, I kind of want it to send audio to my AirPods. By, by denying that... Mm-hmm. Am I denying it the ability to to like route audio to my AirPods? Can you answer that for me? I don't think that's the case because I haven't denied that. Because I, I've been in the habit of of pressing no on everything that I didn't, pretty much everything that I didn't feel like had like a need to connect to a, a physical device like my dash cam, um, and I have not experienced any time where it suddenly wouldn't stream audio to my AirPods, which is the primary way I use my phone. Okay, yeah, I wouldn't expect it to. So. Um, but I think that needs to be... Because I think the system handles that stuff. Yeah, right. So, I think that alert needs to be improved, but... though. Because I'm sure it'll confuse a lot I of agree. people. I agree. A lot of people will just be clicking yes on that, thinking, oh, he just wants to 
talk to my Bluetooth speaker on my AirPods or whatever. And I think it's being triggered errantly even still. Um, because initially when I got, I was 13 and I got it like Facebook and stuff, I'm like, oh, I caught you, Facebook. You're being mal- malicious trying to use my Bluetooth data for tracking. But then it's like some random small apps I've downloaded and games and and stuff stuff that I, I don't have any reason to believe is doing that. And especially when it's almost every app, it asks me that. It feels like it's almost something that if a developer doesn't toggle, they don't want to use Bluetooth, it automatically asks you. And I, th- I just think there needs to be some work done around that in general. I have a theory that, because um, for me, it seems to be all the like media apps. It seems to be all the apps that are capable of Chromecasting. And oh, yeah, interesting. that's my theory. Is that has something to do with the, the, the Chromecast plugin. That that's what it's looking for. Um, for, to use the Bluetooth. Could be wrong. I had an. You just just because you mentioned Chromecast, I had an interesting experience where Siri was smarter than my Google Assistant this morning. Wow. <laughs> well, Stop the press. So I think I mentioned this in the past. I got a, a Google Home, or I think it's called Nest Hub now, a Nest Hub, uh, in my in my bathroom. So when I'm uh, getting ready and showering in the mornings, I can I can get the the weather and the news and all of that while I'm getting ready for the day. Um, and this morning, I asked my Nest Hub for the weather, and and it said, "I don't know how to help you with that yet." And I asked it for the weather again, and it said, uh, "That's a feature I don't have yet, but I'm always learning." Uh, <laughs> really? <laughs> and yeah. So I don't know what was going on, but then, so I had to step into my bedroom and ask Siri for the weather and she knew. So <laughs> you had to go all that way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Literally the, the couple steps, my restroom is off my bedroom, but <laughs> actually I had an interesting experience with Siri and, um, the weather during the week as well. I asked Siri really? as I do every morning what the weather was and you know what she gave me? Mm-hmm. The weather in East Borneo. What? Where is Borneo? Uh, it's in Indonesia. Oh, actually, what? Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> it's in Southeast Asia. I'm not sure if it's own country. Sorry, East Borneos. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, right. But I'm just, well, my wife and they are just cracking up because how did it interpret what's the weather today to what is the weather in East Borneo? Um, it was a nice sunny 20, no, 36, I think, as well, which I would have liked. Being the middle of winter here, <laughs> right? Anyway, man, interesting. Back to maybe it was, has something to do with your accent. <laughs> remember, right, anyway, continue. Back to remember the going. time when when the HomePod first came out, and we were trying to make the HomePod play our podcast. And the only way I could do it was by setting my HomePod to American English to US English, and then putting on a bad. <laughs> bad terrible american <laughs> accent and that's the only way i could make it play uh-huh. the show i haven't tried it since then that was years ago i should see if it can do it now <laughs> you sound like a cowboy <laughs> i'm just so bad so at i'm trying to badly impersonate a cowboy I'm trying to see if i still have it i do still have that video that you sent me do you really mm-hmm. uh, yeah let's let's never release that into the <laughs> okay <laughs> um so my ios 13 roadmap was i think i ran the dev beta 3 and i had my ipad uh lock up fairly frequently respring a few times a day um actually at one point i was at the airport about to get on a plane this was that trip where i just took the ipad only mm-hmm. sitting at the gate and it completely locked up and you know what? I couldn't remember what the hard reset key command like combination was for um, like uh, non-touch ID devices. So that was <laughs> a few minutes of panic because I was getting on like a five-hour flight with a completely locked iPad and I had no idea Is how to unlock it. Is it just power and volume up? It's uh, it- volume up, volume down, and then hold power, like one after the other. Press, press, press. Oh, really? Press, press, hold, rather. That's interesting. You didn't know that either? I would not have figured that out, yeah. Right, exactly. Hmm. Uh, so there's your TIL. 
Um, anyway, <laughs> but uh, so as soon as I got back, um, of course I had the the touch problem. Uh, I had to put it back to iOS twelve. Actually, that was a rigmarole mm-hmm. in itself because I I quickly found out that I didn't have any way of connecting a, a laptop with only USB A ports to a an iPad with USB C because oh right I've got everything in the opposite direction. Mm-hmm. Um, then so yeah, I put it back to iOS twelve. Um, got the new iPad yesterday, and actually all that time I was on iOS twelve, I was just gunning to put the iOS thirteen. Uh, beta back on because there are just so many killer features that uh, just make life easier uh, right and so i i upgraded to the beta yesterday have not experienced a single crash yet crossing my fingers it doesn't happen now that i've said it um all those problems with mail which i did have on beta 3 as well are gone it seems fairly stable although i hear that a lot of people are still having problems in in mail and there's a lot of uncertainty as to whether like this this amount of bugs can be fixed uh you know in the next month and a half <laughs> or, or even less now hmm. yeah my biggest problem with the mail app is that any action that i want to perform on a message now i have to click on what looks like the reply arrow and then i get this sheet that pops up with like all of my options like reply or move to a different folder or everything else and i liked having all those options across the bottom the reply arrow was already over serving its purpose because it it also hid in forward uh and then print as well i think was under the reply arrow oh really yeah <laughs> definitely forward was under there print maybe maybe not um but yeah it it, it already needed to be changed to something else I think also what maybe throws me off the most is that it doesn't seem to follow Apple's design language, at least on an iPhone. If I go into a message, having two buttons in the bottom right corner and nothing in the left doesn't look right at all. Yeah, I just find the whole way that it's shaded now is confusing compared to how it was before. It's not obvious if you're at like the first message in a thread or the last or um, Mm. it's harder to... You know, you could used to be able to do just like the swipe to the right anywhere on the screen to to get your messages list back, and now that seems a little more hit and miss. We are complaining about a beta, but um, it is very late in this season to have this sort of uh, a kind of jumble of jumble of commands and um, stability, instability, rather. Right. Yeah. It's it seems like this is the way they're going. It's just. I kind of liked the old way better. <laughs> uh, what else about iOS 13 do we like? You know, what, one area I'm really having a problem uh, on the iPad is mm-hmm. the old way that I used to open something in like a split view is I would go to the home screen, hold my finger down on like the app I wanted in split view, then with the other hand, mm-hmm. tap the main app that I wanted uh, and what that would do is let you drag the first app that you touched into the split view or into slide over or wherever you want to put it. Whereas now that's impossible. So oh. I don't understand how to get an app into split view if it's not in the dock. It was already a little bit confusing before having to go to the home screen to, to find it. But now you, that doesn't right. work at all. Yeah, I don't think it is possible to do it any other way. Yeah, because you can't even yeah search for an app. So now I have to do this stupid little dance of like, okay, so these are the two apps I want open side by side. I go and open one, and then I close it, and then I open the other, and then I close it, and then I've got them both in the dock, and then I can move them into the spot that I need them to be, which is mm-hmm. obviously a little bit ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I don't know what the solution to that problem is. Um you could keep all of your apps in the dark in that's, folders. That's one solution. <laughs> Another solution, <laughs> I'm hoping Apple isn't pushing people to do this, is that when you have a keyboard, you can uh, invoke Spotlight and then drag out of Spotlight. So I hope Apple isn't thinking, oh, people that use Split View and Slide Over, they're pro users, they've probably got a keyboard attached so they can do it this way. Mm. Well, that's n- not the case. Yeah, you know, I've I've read that that's possible and I've seen people do it in earlier in earlier betas. I can't do that right now on my iPad. If I search for something, I can't drag the app icon to the side. 
Hmm. So I assume it's just a bug in the beta I'm using. It might even be device specific and not something that was broken across all devices, but currently I can't do it. Um, download manager in Safari is something that, how did we live without it really? Because that is such a <laughs> lifesaver. That is pretty nice. I was using it to download like IPSW files and all sorts of things when I was putting my device back to um to iOS 12, uh, yeah, the other week. Um, oh yeah, quickly on that. Um, well, what is your resolution for connecting your iPad to your computer? What'd you end up doing? Um, oh, I just bought a USB A to USB C cable. See, my question was, couldn't you have just removed the beta profile? And then had your device do a complete wipe and, and reinstall. Would that no, have... you have to go into, um, you have to use iTunes to restore, like to downgrade from mm. the beta to the, the um, yeah, that's, standard. that's something that Apple needs is like an internet recovery for iOS devices as well. Yeah, that could be cool. Yeah. Just to make them a little bit more standalone than they already are. Right. Yeah. It's, it's probably one of the last tethers, isn't it? Yeah. That's the only reason I can think of to have to plug a device into yeah, a computer anymore. Um, the new photos yeah. is is really nice. I think, actually, I've already talked about the new photos, saying how good the, the controls are now. Um, yeah. And I, do, I, I didn't think I'd like the new layout of the app, but it's also a, a definite improvement. You get a lot more on the screen, and you can actually control the size of the thumbnails, which is nice when you're... Um, when you're um what's the word uh culling when you've taken like a thousand shots and you want to cull it it's nice to be able to zoom in and out as needed one thing i've been frustrated about in the latest betas um with the announcement of ios 13 apple added some automation triggers that could be triggered by like nfc tags and i recently ordered like a big batch of nfc stickers from amazon so i could start messing around with that and as soon as I got them delivered, like the newest version of iOS pulled that feature out. So hopefully they're working on it and going to add it back in, like in a later version. But now all these stickers are useless. Yeah, they did announce that it is coming back and it was only pulled out temporarily. But there have been a oh, okay. few Good. pretty big features pulled from uh, from the betas. So I, I guess we're going to be expecting them in like 13.1 or a bit later on. Um, yeah, I, mean, I guess that's in line with some of the stuff they've done in the past. So, uh, but yeah, a little frustrating for me. <laughs> yeah, I bet because <laughs> that's really cool. I've been trying to think of ways that you could use the little NFC tags, like uh, at your front door to <laughs> turn on all your um, like entry lights and hallway lights and whatever when you go into your house, or right, um, like one on your just underneath the like the surface of your work desk maybe so you could just tap it there to turn on like work mode i don't know what that might entail but right to red (laughs) 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 i chose a terrible color um yeah my problem is i'd have to come up with something more sophisticated than just something i could do with siri in my home pod because otherwise it's easier just to ask siri to do it or anything that requires more than Anything that is more than one action will be easier because that's, or I mean, that's one of my right. biggest frustrations with Siri at the moment is that it doesn't link, you can't chain any commands. So it's like, yo Siri, blah, blah, yo Siri, blah, blah. And it can take three to get a simple thing done. Um, so I think this is where it would really come in handy because you can just chain like 10 actions into one tag, one tap. Right. I just don't know what I'd want to do more than control my lights. <laughs> so I'm going to have to put some more thought into it. <laughs> um, well, you could have a podcast mode. Right, right. You could have um, one in your car, uh, tap to... Oh, yeah. I mean, you might have to have two for this, but one for leaving home. Turns off all your lights, um, turns on Do Not Disturb and starts playing a podcast. Maybe even starts your car if you've got a smart car like that, but... I know we don't. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, lock your lock your house, lock your front door, if you have a smart lock. Yeah. My problem with all of my automations, um, a lot of my devices support that kind of stuff already. Like my security cameras have like 
away from home modes that will send me alerts if they detect motion when I'm gone. But whether I'm, I'm coming and going never really defines whether or not there's people at the house. Like, usually there's always someone home. Mm-hmm. So I don't get to right. use any of those cool leaving and coming home automations. So Yeah, it's always more complicated than you first think with, with stuff like that. And it's like, let me think. If, if my phone leaves and Trina's phone leaves and... It's like this time of day when the kids are in school, then run this automation or something. (laughs) Yeah, all these edge cases. Yeah. But I bet people will come up with some pretty amazing things. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing stuff posted on the subreddit. So a new report from uh, Ming-Chi Kuo is that Apple is to release an iPhone with both Face ID and underscreen Touch ID in 2021. So that's... Not the iPhone 11 or the 11S next year, but the iPhone 12. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know what to take it. Think about this. I would have told you, adamantly, that this would never happen, even a few weeks ago. But it seems like rumors are getting more and more serious, and and Ming Chi Kuo saying it, like there there has to be at least some like Apple's at least experimenting with this. Which, which, if they're experimenting with it, means that my previous suppositions of them not being willing to backtrack are false. So who knows whether or not we'll actually ever see this. But it seems more likely than ever. Yeah, the question of how long Face ID can stick around is, is a pretty big question as well. Because, I mean, it lives in the notch at the moment. When Apple wants to go notchless, mm-hmm. do we have the, mm-hmm. like the infinity O of Face ID, which consists of like three or four different little cutouts in the screen. I I don't see that happening. That's got to be some sort of like tripophobic nightmare. Uh, So what do they do (laughs) if they want face ID? Are they just going to reduce the size of the notch? Surely they, I mean, if Johnny was there, he's got to be gunning to get rid of the notch altogether, but but he's gone. So Uh, so who knows their priorities (laughs) now? Maybe they're happy with the notch. Uh, I'm kidding. I, I bet they are doing whatever they can to get rid of the notch and... Uh, mm. I mean, I've got no inside knowledge, so <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea how they could possibly put Face ID into a phone with um, with no notch of any kind. So, how I always thought this would end up going is we would have, when we get to a completely notchless, bezel-less phone, it's going to have the cameras and sensors under the display and when it wants to use that, it it turns off an area of the display, like a kind of like an infinity O. But it would like it would like create a notch or an oval on the top of the display where those sensors are, so that the screen isn't interfering with them, and they can see through and take pictures or unlock your phone. And then once you're in this, that part of the screen will come back on. But you're talking um, about like pixels becoming transparent once they're off. Well, I'm. I'm talking about a, a camera that's able to look through the display and has sufficient or uh, sophisticated enough uh, algorithms to remove all the noise that's added by looking through like a mesh of pixels. And then those pixels are turning themselves off to not add extra light while that sensor is on. Right. Okay. Um, but I mean, I know it's possible companies already have prototypes of this working. Um but I guess I guess maybe this is Apple experimenting with with both technology options because if they can't ever get that working well enough, they might have to go back to some kind of fingerprint sensor, which is already proven working technology and under displays. Slightly different from what they had before, though, because it would have to be this uh, what do they call it? Ultrasonic fingerprint reader. That seems to be the best way to do it right now. Yeah, made by none other than best friend Qualcomm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, what, what you said that they're they're probably uh, experimenting or testing both, in, you know, in case one doesn't work as well as the other, is I think a more likely scenario. Um, right. But then on the other hand, to have double authentication is is not a bad thing. I mean, it, it, it fits in line with Apple's as secure as possible sort of kind of philosophies. Right. Yeah. Apple was always the company that was 
you know, we'll make pass pass codes as simple as possible so you can get in. It's like, well, if you don't use a pass code, we'll have the fingerprint reader so that so that your phone's always locked, even if you want to put as little effort into unlocking it as possible. And um, how nice is it so going to be to have that to sense. authenticate with both things? <laughs> like, are are you implying that you'd have to use both? Ah, oh, that that's how I had it in my mind. Like they're going to make it as secure oh. as possible. You're going to have to authenticate both to get in. Ooh, I would hope that's an option because I would hate to lose the convenience of the last few years of having Face ID. I've gotten so used to it now, and I don't understand people who still think that Touch ID is the easier solution or the nicer solution. I'm still pretty uh, torn. I think I've, I've said really? that. Really? Yeah. There's no denying that Face ID wins easily when it comes to saving like bezels, because I mean you could you could sure. put it on the back, or as some people do, put it into like the lock button on the side. Um. But when you're comparing Apple's implementations of either have this massive bezel or Face ID, then Face ID easily wins. But um, for actual usability, I think Touch ID was mm-hmm. easy to use. Yeah, I don't think Touch ID was ever hard to use. But the things like I got a text message while I'm working and I just glance at my phone and it unlocks and I can read the message. Yeah, so you've had to prop you know, up your phone to do that though. Well, all of my wireless chargers are stands. So I guess that's one of the benefits of doing that. Um, it sits on a on a wireless charging stand while I'm working. So if if you didn't have that, but even if it was sitting flat on your desk, I think if it was at the right angle and distance from your face, you could easily look down at it and it would unlock. Do you know how weird that feels to like do the whole crane neck over the device to get it to the register? <laughs> I mean, even when I'm sitting okay. on the couch and my iPad is kind of on my knees, when I've got my legs bent, often it's not at a high enough angle to get my face and I, you know you have to kind of lift it up um mm-hmm. yeah but uh i i wouldn't go back i would still take face id over touch id hmm. so maybe, maybe it's just maybe that's why i have such a different experiences it's it's my implementation and like my my desk setups make it more convenient but just not having to reach for my phone to unlock it has been has been very nice in the last couple of years um, a lot of people in the comments are saying things like the, like this year's phone or the next year's phone is sounding pretty boring. So I mean, mm-hmm. what do you think? I, there aren't many exciting rumors. I mean, the biggest change is what going to be the triple camera. That's hardly exciting. Yeah, that seems. I mean, it's the biggest thing we know about. Yeah, I guess. Like. Yeah. Like I said, I really hope we see ProMotion this year. They could add Apple Pencil support if they needed another killer feature to get people to upgrade. Um, I saw rumors just either today or yesterday that there might be a new dark green color for the flagship models. Right, yeah, from that um, uh, supposed ex-Foxconn employee who's been working on these. As, right. Um, I don't know how much to trust that person specifically, but leaks like that have happened in the past and been incredibly accurate. Mm. So That leak was the entire shopping list of what could be on the phone. And um, nothing was, mm-hmm. I think, new info or a surprise except for the uh, supposed dark green color. Right. Um, I don't know. They could, they could do some interesting software things with these new cameras to sell it. Uh, there's supposedly a nicer selfie cam, which should make a lot of people happy. Uh, I don't know. But but it doesn't come in a new chassis, so no one's going to be as excited about right. it. Right. This is going to be the iPhone 7 of the uh, Face ID era. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, same chassis, not any huge increases, uh, improvements. Looks the right. same, but is just Nicer camera. roll faster yeah. <laughs> and better, but you know, unless you're following it closely. I mean, you're pr- probably not going to know. That would make 3D Touch the the new iPhone's headphone jack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was the biggest thing, hey, what they took away. That could be uh, uh-huh. history repeating itself. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's their new cycle is they, they have a new design and they improve the internals the next year. And the year after that, they take something <laughs> away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gold. But then if they do have a completely new design <laughs> next year, they can't call it the 11 plus, uh, S. 
Well, that might be why they're... Well, they... See, if they just went with, instead of iPhone 11 and iPhone 11 Pro, it's just iPhone and iPhone Pro, then they wouldn't have to worry about that in the future. Mm. But you're right. Maybe they're doing a four-year cycle with this design, and the 2021 iPhone is the big change. Yeah, they've got to want to get rid of the notch, though. Mm. You'd, you'd really hope that they'd be slimming it down. I was hoping they'd do it this year, but it doesn't sound like mm. it. Well, I look forward to September. Yep, me too. It's always a holiday for me. <laughs> <laughs> and it always falls like right on the week of my birthday, so it's always a good uh, always present for myself. Week. <laughs> well, I'm James VDM on Reddit and on Twitter. And I'm Jelly Woot on Reddit and Twitter. I meant to apologize for audio problems to our listeners um, at the start, but I forgot mm. about that. Um, hopefully this show is louder for everyone. I think I've worked out which part of the processing is... Um, oh, man. I I'm, I'm <laughs> have no idea about audio engineering. I don't even know the words, but... Uh, the uh, peak levels you know how everything that's released is kind of mastered at near maximum volume you know some people complain about that when it comes to music i can't remember the exact terminology okay. but uh, this show should be at that level like as loud as it can be without it goes to distortion okay and now everyone knows why previous shows have been too quiet because i have no idea what i'm talking about <laughs> <laughs> People, uh, I was going to say, um, sponsored us, but we, we don't really have that option anymore. But if they were to, uh, I don't know, listen to our ads extra hard, maybe we can afford professional audio engineers in the future when we're a big podcasting company because of how great our show is. <laughs> Actually, they could support us <laughs> on our anchor page. There is an option to support. Uh, it's not something we've pushed, but it is there. Uh, it's kind of like the Patreon oh. of... Um, of Anchor, the Anchor podcasting platform. You just don't get anything for it. You just you can support us. Are we even aware of people who are supporting us? Uh, we like would be if, if there we were anyone, aff- if there was anyone. Well, well, not just that there's people sponsoring us, but like specifically who, so we could offer like awards independent of Anchor if we wanted to. Uh, we'd probably have a list. I don't know. You hmm. go ahead and sponsor us. <laughs> I'll see what I can offer you. <laughs> okay. Just like the Patreon, I'm the only <laughs> patron. <laughs> uh, um, so I got a shiny new Apple card. I'll sign that up. Yeah, first purchase. <laughs> Sending mm-hmm. money to ourselves. <laughs> so I have a new so iPad Tom- Pro 11 inch. I had, um, if you, for people who aren't aware, I had the, the touch disease. I think I'm the only one calling that. Maybe. Uh, but where it just wouldn't um, register touches just randomly. It could do it like five times in 10 minutes or it could do it once in a day. So it was really hard to kind of to troubleshoot and to get Apple to take it back. Um, someone mm-hmm. made a helpful post on the subreddit about catching it on video, which is what I ended up trying to do. And it took hours of video to get like three examples of it happening. Um <laughs> and so I booked okay. in a oh well, yeah a few weeks ago I tried to book it in but then I couldn't catch it on video and I left it too late um, so then I finally I made the video first and then I booked in the genius appointment and took it in mm-hmm. and they begrudgingly accepted my video of it happening as proof <laughs> although he did point out that this video could have been of anyone I mean who knows? This could have been another iPad that you were filming. You could have found this video on the internet. It was a little insulting, really. Although, I mean, <laughs> they did swap it, so how angry can I be? Um, but what I should have done is put my face in the video and um, maybe also this, try and get like the serial number of the iPad in the same video so it was right. like plainly obvious. I guess what would the... What are they trying to accuse you of? Wanting to trade a good iPad for another good iPad? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Although it, here in Australia, at least, when if you get your iPad swapped, it resets the two-year consumer law. So I now have two more years of warranty on my iPad, which is nice. Since it's wow, that is nice. a year old now, more or less. Right. 
And it it wasn't new when you got it, right? No, it was, yeah, a few months old. So now you do basically have a new one, which is, that's very nice. Yeah, and I did have a not insignificant scratch, not hairline scratch on my screen, so it's nice to be scratch-free again. Uh, but physically, <laughs> apart from that, the old one was perfect, so it was just this touch disease. And, and sadly, it seems to be affecting, like, tons, like, thousands and thousands of people if you go by what's on, like, Mac Rumors forums and the Apple support communities. Um, there are tons of people having Man. this touch problem. Um, I mostly notice it when trying to scroll. Like, you can, you know, like you'd scroll on the screen. It would involve, like, four motions of the finger and, like, a flicking sort of action. And it could be, like, zero mm-hmm. to four of them that just didn't respond to the touch. Huh. Well... I've luckily not had to deal with that yet, but that's a scary thing for me to have to keep an eye out for in the future now. <laughs> yeah, could be. Huh. <laughs> um, but yeah, apart... But at least if it does happen, I'll know how to do it. The only other um, hassle with the whole changing over process was that they didn't have any uh, units in stock to give me when I was there. So they, they promised me one and then said, we'll send you an email uh, when we've got one in stock and you can come in and pick it up. And I've not always had good okay. experiences with them doing that, such as they promised to give me a, um, to replace my MacBook Pro with a slightly different model once. And then when I came back in, they pretended that that <laughs> was not a thing. And if they'd done it, you know, on the day, I might have avoided a few right. MacBook Pro keyboard issues. Not bitter at all. Which is how you end up with the iPad in the first place. Exactly. You need to learn and. <laughs> I keep telling myself I need to do this, and I always forget until it it bites me in the butt later to, like, record all of my interactions with people like that. Yeah. Um, It's kind of creepy, though, isn't it? Well, it's really easy if you have something, like, on your watch where you can just record conversations. But then you have Um, to tell them you're recording it. Oh, that's not a law here. (laughs) Oh, okay. Actually, I have no idea if it is or not, but Mm. is it? maybe it's just manners, then, to tell someone that you're recording a conversation with them. It depends on the state here but in my state it's single party consent so both people don't have to know okay um but yeah that that is true in some places single party um, consent is such like an oxymoron isn't it <laughs> <laughs> yeah you really couldn't use that in uh for any situation other than voice recording without it becoming immediately <laughs> scary <laughs> yeah well i knew i was recording what's the problem <laughs> Um, but also I think that applies more for legal situations. So if it was just like a, he said, she said, where it's like, when I've had issues, with my landlords were like, I never said I would do that. I'm like, well, actually I have a recording of you saying you would do that. You know, that might be enough. I, you know, it wouldn't be admissible in court, but it might be enough to get them to do what they said they were going to do. Mm, so, yeah. um, I made a point to do that when I was car shopping a few months ago. Um, but yeah, interactions with landlords or if I was going into, to talk to like, uh, like an Apple Store employee about some kind of service issue, if that were to come up, are there cases where I need to remember to do that but always forget? Yeah, if it was being done to me in the reverse, I guess it depends on the situation, but I can't... I just imagine I would be uncomfortable if the reverse was being done to me. Um, yeah. So if someone announced they were doing it, I probably probably wouldn't have a problem with it, depending on the situation. Um, but it's, I mean, looking into like the future, the, uh, dystopian future. Everything you do is already recorded anyway. Exactly. (laughs) That's where I was going. (laughs) Um, so I probably just have to, you know, stop being the get off my lawn old man and embrace it. Maybe I'm more comfortable with that than the average person because I've, I've been living with like cameras in my home for the last few years. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really used to being recorded at all times. Uh, whereas I know like if I have guests, especially someone like staying in my house for a few days, they, they're very uncomfortable. I usually unplug the cameras for them when they come over. Mm -hmm. So, but if they're security cameras, someone's got to understand unless it's like in the bathroom or (laughs) in their bedroom. Right. It's, there's only like two in the common spaces in my house and then I have some on the perimeter. Uh, but even then, uh, People are un- uncomfortable with it sometimes. Mm, okay. Um, like, especially uh, my girlfriend's parents. Uh, 
I usually um, turn all the cameras off when they come over because mm. it's not even worth like, well, what does it matter if, if I have a record what you said in the living room? But <laughs> mm. are we entering the age of privacy or the opposite? <laughs> yeah, I'm one of those people who's like, yeah, I use Apple because they're so concerned about privacy, but also I have cameras in my house that just watch me at all times. <laughs> <laughs> so mm. and i have i have tape over my webcam even on my imac but i have oh, webcams you're one of in my those people room. you're a madman <laughs> uh, hey especially after the zoom thing that just happened the other day mm. yeah i'm one of those people yeah but the light comes on you would know that's fair uh a mac it's less of a concern than on a windows computer i think even the camera is like wired through the light so there's no way for the camera to come on without a light on. So yeah, there is something like that, isn't there? Some... Yeah. Mm. But uh, yeah, I never use it. So why, why leave it uncovered and even even risk? I mean, I don't know what I'm risking: the invasion of someone looking into my little podcasting booth, and <laughs> versus <laughs> not worrying about people accessing, you know, like my family room camera. <laughs> <laughs> well, have you seen that new uh, movie with um, Seth Rogen? And uh, Charlie's Theron, long shot. That's what it's called. Uh, no, I uh, okay. Well, there's an argument in Does there it... to covering your webcam. I'll leave it at that. Leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> if it's a Seth Rogen movie, I have an idea what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually not a bad movie. Actually, I'll it's pretty it bad, but it's watchable. I'll put it. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I am going to transition to the new uh, locally encrypted option of home security cameras when the new uh, Apple OS has come out this fall. Oh, that'll be good. Yeah. Yeah. I got to find the right cameras to use. I don't even know which ones are going to support that yet. But Are you feeling a bit uh, vulnerable with your current non-unencrypted cameras? <laughs> I mean, it's it's... The encryption is more of a bonus to me because I'm using Nest Cams right now and they don't even have like HomeKit support, which is what I'd really, I'm really looking forward to gaining out of that. Uh, but then, yeah, the local encryption will be just a, a bonus on top of that. I had a, a possible, I haven't gotten to the bottom of this, like a possible um, network, home network intrusion during the week. My NAS suddenly stopped refusing, stopped accepting my username and password. This is a QNAP NAS. Really? And also, it seems that the um, the the hardware reset button has been disabled. Can you believe that that's actually an option in the uh, in the <laughs> settings? Is that that's you can crazy. disable the hardware reset button? So now I both wow. can't hardware reset it and um, can't log into it. Uh, so what are you? Have you done anything about that yet, or is it just currently inaccessible? Uh, I just switched it off, basically. <laughs> I had yeah. a very quick attempt at um, SSHing into it, but the mm-hmm. QNAP help article, which has a, like 80% down votes, so I didn't have high hopes to begin with, um, yeah, was not helpful in uh, SSHing into it to actually do some sort of config reset um, some other way. Um, wow. So currently it's unusable. Um, but of course, I don't know if someone's gotten into it or not because I can't get into it myself to check. <laughs> it does sound that way, though. It does, doesn't it? Uh, I'm not hmm. concerned, though, because literally all I held was TV shows and movies. So <laughs> someone got access to all my MKVs. That's it. And <laughs> there's also nothing really else on the network that um, could be exploited in any way. I mean, it, pretty much everything else is iOS or one MacBook Air that spends most of its life turned off. Well, not turned off, but right. asleep. Hmm. Interesting. But yeah. <laughs> you can disable the hardware reset. Oh, yeah. Hmm. So if you can't get in, you're just out in the ass? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Hmm. I haven't looked into it long enough. This has got to be a way to reset the password if you re- if you turn off the reset button. It does not make sense that you, yeah. if you forgot the password, like if you discount the possibility that someone hacked in and changed if you just forgot the password and you disabled the Mm -hmm. hardware reset button hardware reset button it it can't be that this is suddenly a useless device 
I mean, mine is just like a low end right. device, but what if it was like a two thousand dollar NAS? I out right. two thousand dollars. Can't be. I mean, that's like the mantra of network security is that if if someone has access to the hardware, they have access to everything. Right. Because there's no way to get. Yeah, because you have to be able to reset that kind of stuff. So, which is less true now with Apple stuff with their iCloud locking everything. But, mm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, I think that's a show.